there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. with us on a musical journey through some of the most magnificent places on earth. Great towns and cities of Europe, steeped in history and beauty, and resounding with the stories and music of the world's greatest composers. Debussy, Rossini, Chopin, Elgar, Rachmaninoff. Just some of the greats in our classical destinations. Hello, I'm Simon Callow. Welcome to Classical Destinations. Here we are in Moscow, behind me the Kremlin center of Russian power for centuries and centuries, whether czarists or communists. Moscow also the home of many great musicians, among them Sergei Rachmaninoff, perhaps the greatest pianist of the 20th century, one of the greatest conductors, and certainly one of the most loved of all composers, Russian to the depths of his soul. But he never returned here to his native country after the Bolsheviks seized power in 1917. Centuries of oppression by the Tsars had finally ignited revolt as the population, wearied by the ravages of war and the resulting collapse of the economy, could take no more. But for many, one kind of repression was simply replaced by another, something more terrifying altogether, rigid control of how you thought and of how you expressed yourself. For an artist like Rachmaninoff, the prospect was unthinkable. Stalin exerted his control everywhere, and he wanted to rebuild Moscow as the Rome of the North, a grand testimony to the power and glory of the Soviet state. A notable example of what became known as the Stalinist Gothic style is Moscow's magnificent State University building, completed in 1953. It's easy to see why the less charitable called this style wedding cake architecture. While Stalin's ruthless redesign of his capital saw the destruction of a great many historic buildings, so much has thankfully survived, and Moscow is a rich mixture of styles and periods spanning a thousand years of history. There can't be too many cities in the world where wonderful old churches from the 13th and 14th centuries compete for attention with 20th century spacecraft. The grounded Buran space shuttle is just one of the many attractions in Moscow's famous Gorky Park. Two centuries before Stalin, Peter the Great began shaping Moscow into a stylish city to match the very best in Western Europe, with wide boulevards and expansive squares. His contribution to the city's development is commemorated with a towering statue unveiled in 1997, which looks down the Moskva River, guarding the old center he helped to create. Dominating the opposite bank of the river is the huge Cathedral of Christ the Savior. It was completed in 1997 too. Stalin destroyed the original, which had been built to commemorate Russia's victory over Napoleon. Recent Russian history is, of course, associated with communism, but the country has been deeply religious for centuries. And these beliefs have influenced its art, its literature, and, of course, its music. Red Square is dominated by the great cathedral of St. Vasily behind me, named after the holy fool, Vasily the Blessed. A wonderful honeycomb of small chapels, icons, intense religious feeling. And Rachmaninoff, though a man of the world to his long fingertips, was a deeply pious man. And he paid homage to the Russian Orthodox Church in two great settings of the liturgy, which is still widely performed today. A 
and the exquisite voices of Moscow's anima vocal ensemble provide a living link with Rachmaninoff's music, which they regularly perform inside the Kremlin throughout the year. Sergei Vasilievich Rachmaninov was born in 1873 in the province of Novgorod, roughly halfway between Moscow and St. Petersburg. The family were very wealthy, but not for long. By the time Rachmaninov was nine, his profligate father had squandered everything. The family estate had to be sold and his parents separated. But there was a silver lining. As an aristocrat, Rachmaninov could never have been a professional musician. And now, living in St. Petersburg with his mother's family, Rachmaninoff's emerging musical talents were nurtured by his grandmother, who regularly took the boy to church. Here, his love of sacred choral music was born. Here, in the splendidly ornate Cathedral of the Archangel, right inside the Kremlin walls, in the final resting place of nearly four centuries of Tsars, Rachmaninoff's haunting and worshipful music truly stirs the soul. Rachmaninoff was the greatest virtuoso pianist of his age, and his brilliant and challenging piano music continues to inspire legions of young pianists, such as the highly talented Russian Alexander Kobrin, whose interpretation of Rachmaninoff's work has been described as captivating and poetic. Like so many of the great Russian musicians before him, Kobrin studied at the Moscow Conservatory, and in June 2005 won the prestigious gold medal at the Van Kleiben International Piano Competition, playing, among other pieces, Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini. I've been playing Rachmaninoff since I was a kid, and I'm trying to uh, play it as well as much as possible. And I love his music. Uh, of course, you could feel all the nostalgia, all his feelings, all his love about his country, about everything. And it's so deep, and uh, of course, it's always a very big challenge for, uh, for any musician to play his music. Sergei Rachmaninoff was one of the most prodigally gifted musicians who ever lived. Perhaps the greatest pianist of his day, a superb conductor both of opera and orchestral music, and of course, an inspired composer. But he had a rather slow start, as it happens, being a rather sluggish student, until an encounter here at the Moscow Conservatoire with Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, certainly the greatest composer of his time, a man whose music Rachmaninoff idolized. Rachmaninoff astonished Tchaikovsky by playing again a piece of music he'd heard for the first time at that concert from memory. Uh, Tchaikovsky here is shown rather surprisingly conducting an activity that he detested. In fact, he was so uh, anxious about conducting, so self-conscious, that he formed the impression that when he conducted an orchestra, his head would fall off. So he, he always conducted with his head in one hand and his baton in the other. Transformed instantly into a dedicated student, Rachmaninoff triumphantly completed his studies by achieving the highest award that could be bestowed by Russia's musical academia, the Gold Medal. He won it with a symphony, a one-act opera, 
and a collection of songs. The stage was set for the start of a glittering career and then disaster. The premiere in March 1897 of Rachmaninoff's first symphony was a debacle. It had taken him two years to compose, and he held high hopes for its success. But the conductor, the famous composer, Alexander Glazunov, was drunk and unprepared. The performance was a total shambles, and the critics heartlessly tore the music apart. Rachmaninoff, just 23, was devastated. He destroyed the score, swearing never to compose again, and spent the next three years fighting the demons of depression and doubt. By a strange twist of fate, five years later, Rachmaninoff had the opportunity of taking terrible revenge on Glazunov, but as his grandson Alexander relates, it was not in his nature to do so. The conductor who had the role to perform for the first time a work from Glazunov catch a very big cold, and instead of him, it was the, my grandfather to conduct. And everybody was telling him, like, oh, come on, Serge, you have the opportunity to really revenge yourself, to make a horrible performance on this. And he answered, no, gentlemen, I shall do my best. And so he worked very hard, and he made a brilliant performance of the the Symphony of Glazunov. This is the home of another visionary Russian composer of piano music, Alexandr Skriabin, now painstakingly preserved as a museum by a handful of dedicated volunteers. Skriabin and Rachmaninov shared similar paths in music, including the same exacting piano teacher as teenagers, and they became friends. Skriabin's cozy study was a regular meeting place for Russian musicians before the revolution where, no doubt, the deteriorating political situation was frequently discussed. And this is Skriabin's custom-made Beckstein grand piano, which Rachmaninoff liked so much, he subsequently used it for concerts. Some sessions with a hypnotist in 1900 are said to have restored Rachmaninoff to musical good health. Once again, he composed, he conducted, and he performed around the world great acclaim until 1917. So Rachmaninoff left his native Russia never to return. He spent years touring the concert halls of the world, mostly to make money. He moved house from Sweden to Paris, finally settling in the United States of America. And he rarely composed during these years. And then, finally, in 1929, he found a place which would give him the peace and the concentration he needed to exercise his great gift, that of composing. In 1929, Rachmaninoff was visiting a friend in Switzerland, and he ran into another old friend, a great Polish pianist, and indeed Prime Minister, Paderewski. Paderewski pointed out an advertisement in the newspaper showing that there was a plot of land on the side of Lake Lucerne for sale. Rachmaninoff went over immediately, and in 40 minutes, he decided to buy it. Here, he would build his dream villa. And while the house was being built over three long years, he kept an eye on proceedings here, in this little hut, where he practiced and composed and dreamt his villa. And here it is, the house that Rachmaninoff built for himself. Unexpectedly modern, but very much the house he wanted.
He supervised the building closely. It's built according to numerological and musical considerations very particular to him. And he called it the Villa Senar, Sergei Natalia Rachmaninov. And here he wrote two of his absolute masterpieces with this astonishing view of Lake Luzerne before him. Hardly surprisingly, Rachmaninoff became both calm and inspired in these surroundings. This is what he looked at every day of his life. Lake Luzerne, listening to the quiet lapping of the boat. Sometimes he took a boat himself, sometimes he swam in the waters. He was very happy here. And this is the study. It's cool, it's calm, it's orderly, it's light, it's very joyful. It's a fantastic space, very concentrated. Here, of course, is the great piano, the Steinway that Frederick Steinway himself gave to Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff always played on Steinway pianos. Here he practiced, but he didn't compose. He never composed at the piano. He composed entirely in his head, complete orchestral scores down to the last detail. Here he wrote in his mind the rhapsody on a theme of Paganini. And he went to a music supplier's and he ordered 43 pages of manuscript paper. And that's exactly how long the rhapsody on a theme of Paganini lasts. Brilliantly ingenious and deliciously melodious, which explains its enduring popularity. The Paganini Rhapsody is one of five works that Rachmaninoff composed for piano and orchestra. All challenge the pianist in different ways. And here are Rachmaninoff's hands, as it were, plaster casts of his actual hands those legendary hands with their 22-note span, which made him the unbeatable virtuoso that he was. Uh, and here, up here on the shelf, are uh, photographs of heroes, admirers, friends. Heroes like Rimsky-Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, admirers like, uh, oh, for example, Thomas Alva Edison there, Josef Hoffmann, one of the very greatest pianists of his time, whose photograph is inscribed, Dear Meister von Meister, Master of Masters. It's quite a tribute from, from a fellow pianist. And uh, um, Charlie Appin, great charm of his, and, and a highly distinguished man of the arts, like Bunin, the poet. And here, a little more surprisingly, perhaps, no coward for Sergei Rachmaninoff, with admiration, as well he might have. But it does tell us something about Rachmaninoff's celebrity status. He was a star among stars. For many people, the most famous classical musician of the age. Today, this villa is home to Rachmaninoff's grandson, Alexander, who, but for a few modern appliances, has kept it very much as it was in the 1930s. Here, those remarkable hands again, two different angles on them. Middle-aged Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff with his very great friend, Fyodor Shalyapin, feel the worse for wear, perhaps. Uh, here, the boats that he rode in on Lake Luzerne. Group portrait of friends, very relaxed, easy, laughing, Shalyapin, Rachmaninoff, and their great friend, Michael Chekhov, the greatest Russian actor of the 20th century. And here, most impressively, Rachmaninoff, and Tsar Nicholas II. This is Zurich, 
Switzerland's biggest city, situated at the northern end of Lake Zurich. It's a smart and stylish place, as you might expect, an important banking center, but surprisingly relaxed as well. From here, you travel south to the majestic Swiss Alps and the even more photogenic city of Luzern. Easily reached from both Zurich and Bern, Luzern began as a 7th century fishing village and it's here that the nation of Switzerland began 700 years ago. Its popularity as a tourist destination soared after Queen Victoria visited in 1868. The city's most distinctive landmarks are the 14th century Chapel Bridge, Europe's oldest covered walkway, and the wonderful 13th century octagonal water tower alongside. It's a place full of cultural, religious and musical history. The dramatic peaks of Mount Rigi and Mount Pilatus dominate the skyline, and in many places the mountains run right down to the water. Classic paddle steamers still serve as ferries, including to Vegis at the base of Mount Rigi, from where you can climb the mountain on the famous Vitznau Rigi Bahn Cog Railway. A truly memorable journey. It's easy to see why Rachmaninoff loved this place so much and was so inspired by his surroundings. The scenery is simply breathtaking. And Luzern itself is the epitome of Swiss picture postcard prettiness, except that it's even prettier in real life. The soaring sounds of the Rhapsody on the theme of Paganini are the perfect accompaniment. The local community very much took Rachmaninoff to heart, as we can see from this splendid statue. But so much of his life had been spent in flight, from war or from revolution. In 1905, he escaped the first Bolshevik revolution. In 1917, the second, and now finally, in 1939, the Second World War drove Rachmaninoff away from his Swiss idyll. Sergei Rachmaninoff died in Los Angeles on the 28th of March, 1943, aged 70, and is buried in New York. Such was his utter distaste for what happened in his beloved homeland. After 1917, the family continued to refuse all requests to return his remains to Russia. His peace will not be disturbed. Rachmaninoff's music is intensely emotional, very personal, very expressive, but often it is of a classic beauty, in a way that can easily move you to tears. The vocalise, originally written as a song without words, is played here by the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Rachmaninoff at his melancholic best. Rachmaninoff said, music is enough for a lifetime, but a lifetime is not enough for music. Sergei Rachmaninoff the last of the great Russian romantic masters. It's a good ride from me, Simon Keller. See you next time on Classical Destinations. Bye. Classical Destinations will be returning to Moscow soon, but next we're going to visit Germany for an appointment with two of the most controversial composers ever, Richard Strauss and Richard Wagner.